Hi, everyone. Welcome to the fact-finding webinar on the recent concluded uh, beach nourishment project in Mount Lavinia. The pearl protectors have been voicing out our concerns about this project since the project started. Uh, so we have reached out to all the relevant authorities and have provided reasons as to why this project is not sustainable. Unfortunately, at that time, none of the authorities had, the po had a positive response on this. Um, we all know what happened to this project within a very short time. Um, as of now, more than two thirds of, our, of the sea nourished, uh, sand nourished area is lost. And it's the same fate we can see in Kalutara and in Angulana. So our intention of doing this webinar is to create awareness amongst the public uh, of the facts and not to show any political interest or bias. We will be delving into various aspects of the beach nourishment, which was done through the Coastal Conservation Department. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to introduce you the panel. So I'm joined today with uh, Akita. He's, uh, he's a scuba diver, and he's also uh, and he's also the uh, the person who did the plastic seabed of Sri Lanka. Then, of course, we have uh, Amila. Uh, he's an ecologist who is also an expert in the biodiversity of the Sri Lanka. Of Sri Lanka, he's also the advisor for the pearl protectors. We have Avishka. Uh, she's a climate change and sustainability expert. She's also the awareness coordinator of the pearl protectors. Uh, we have Malisha. She's an LLB undergraduate with a keen interest in the legal framework surrounding our environment. She's also the advocacy coordinator and one of the long-standing team members of the Pearl Protectors. Uh, we have uh, Praveen. He's a civil engineer with a keen interest in our marine environment. And I'm Mudita. I'm the coordinator of the Pearl Protectors. So we will be conducting this symposium in English. And it is live broadcasted through Facebook and on YouTube. So uh, you can share this link uh, with anyone uh, you may think who's interested in this field or in this area. It is also available on YouTube. Uh, you're also invited to take notes uh, of the and any records of this uh, webinar. So this webinar will last, uh, it'll be for one hour. We'll keep any questions till the end. Or if you think there is something relevant, uh, you can ask the questions and we will ask our panelists uh, the question. So we'll start off with, um, Avishka, can you give us a, what would be, um, sorry, let's talk about a narrative, what happened, right? So would you be able to give us a timeline narrative of what happened in Mount Lavinia? Sure. Um, so Mount Lavinia Beach Nourishment Project was carried out under the Kalutara North Calido Beach Development Project. Uh, which was implemented in Calido Beach, Kalitara, Angulana Beach, Rathmanana, and Mount Lavinia uh, as well. So the project was implemented by the Coastal Conservation and Coastal Resource Management Department, short, you know, com commonly known as CCD, in Sri Lanka. Uh, the project proposal was su submitted in 2018 and was approved by the cabinet, but it was only implemented around late February of 2020. Uh, the Mount Avenue Beach Management Project started um, early April uh, 2020 during the curfew period. Uh, as we all know, that was, uh, that was a strange period for all of us. And uh, the curfew period was imposed by the government because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, one of the key points is that it was initiated without the knowledge of the residents in the area. And uh, no prior mention of the project uh, was taking place, um, uh, no, no, no prior project of the mention taking place during COVID period uh, was also mentioned to the public. And the, and, and the area was heavily guarded as well. Uh, residents were confused when they, sh uh, when, when they saw the, um, the, the, the ships, the dredging ships, but uh, they didn't know what was going on until around mid-April um, when they actually saw the ongoing beach nourishment project. 
Um, the whole project cost around 890 million Sri Lankan rupees. The Mount Avignon portion was around 100, uh, 100 million uh, Sri Lankan rupees. Um, the whole project was contracted to access engineering um, and the and then it was subcontract, uh, subcontracted to a Danish company called Road Nielsen. They are the experts in uh, beach nourishment projects and they have been conducting beach nourishment projects in other parts of the country as well. Um, Montevina beach nourishment project was conducted without an IEE or an EIA. And the sand used for the Montevina beach nourishment project was around 150,000 cubic meters according to the Director General of the CCD. Um, the Director General of the CCD actually uh, mentioned that the Mount Avenia project was supposed to only last for four to five years. But a successful beach nourishment should last for at least ten, eight to 10 years. Um, this just proves that there is no sustainability in this project and that they didn't even consider the sustainability aspect um, when they were initiating this project as well. Uh, and when you take the cost of the beach nourishment project, <laughs> it's been a huge waste of taxpayer money, um, especially if the CCD was planning on spending the same amount of money or more, again, in another four to five years on the same area. Um, furthermore, the rate at which the beach is currently being eroded is proof that without barriers in place, this niche, niche nourishment was not going to be successful. And uh, also the time, the period they decided to do this beach nourishment project, project was not ideal either because of the Southwestern monsoon season. And um, the dredging sand from the deep sea was only a few kilometers away. And that is also not sustainable, especially if the sand that was dredged is not properly utilized and if you can't see an actual uh, solution here. Um, I will show you a few images. First one I'm going to show you is the actual stretch of the Mount Avenia Beach Project, uh, Beach Nourishment. Just give me a second. Uh, can can you see? Yes. Yes. Um, so this is the area that I'm talking about. From from Mount Avenia Hotel up till around here. Hmm. This area. And uh, if I'm to show you before and after images. So this is before, this is after the beach nourishment was done, and um, this is now, the eroded beach, as you can see, with the rock boulders coming out. There's another picture that I would like to show. So this was taken in th uh, on the 30th of May. As you can see, all the rocks have bulged out. And this is in third June, on, on third June, four days later. Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay. that's just uh, a small narrative of what happened and where we are today. Within, within four days, there was like at least three to four meters of sand erosion. Yeah. So that's, I mean, he says it'll be lasting for four years, but not even 30 days. Exactly. So, um, exactly. so Mount Lavinia is a, it's a unique geog, it has a unique geography and it has reefs out there. Um, so I think Akita would be the best person to, you know, explain. So can you explain about the unique geography in Mount Lavinia and how, um, how are the reefs affecting this geography? 
Yes, um, Mudita, first I would like to talk about the geography uh, in the Mount Lavinia, Mount Lavinia area. Um, so actually Mount Lavinia, the, the where the project was conducted is a headland. Like in Singhala, we call it a Tudua. So hmm. with the whole topography of uh, the uh, western coast, uh, the the waves always uh, travels from uh, south uh, south to kind of to the west uh, north uh, 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 to the south to the north. So now when when there is a headland, uh, the sand is collected on the south side of the headland, and it and there will be a natural uh, erosion uh, bay naturally stabilized erosion bay on the northward side of the uh, headland. So, for example, uh, Mount Lavinia Beach, like uh, the Mount Lavinia Hotel is situated on the headland. So, the Mount Lavinia Beach has a private beach, sandy beach, towards the south side of the hotel because it is situated on the headland and the rock formation that we can see, the, where the a uh, beach nourishment project was carried out is the naturally stabilized bay where the natural erosion happens mm -hmm. so uh, uh, th so for this example i would like to uh, like anybody can uh, go through the map of sri lanka the best uh, best course and shall i share the Tango. pictures uh, akita yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, give me uh, 30 seconds after that we'll right. come on to the pictures yeah. Um, yeah. So if we if we look at uh, the west coast, it's always if you have a head headland on onto your south onto the southern side of the headland, it would be a sandy beach, and there would be an erosion bay on the north northward side of the headland. Um, so this can be seen from Tangal to uh, Putlam, uh, the whole uh, west coast of Sri Lanka. And uh, furthermore, I would like to give some examples where mm -hmm. human intervention uh, have done um, like the exact same thing. What I'm talking about the south side sandy beach and erosion towards the north side of the um, headland. Like for example, this one is the Hikadu uh, fishing port. Hikadu fishing port was after it was created. Uh, the beach strip in Hikkadu was expanded naturally because the beach strip was on the south side of the headland. And uh, now we can see a very good uh, current example is the port uh, city project. And mm -hmm. when the port city project, uh, the breakwater was constructed, the golf face green beach has been is being now extended naturally. So in another two or three years, we, we can see a full beach on the uh, golf face green area. And uh, as the same impact is for the Kakadu area, there is natural erosion happening as per now. So same principle is uh, occurred in the headland uh, in Mount Lavinia. So uh, now we can uh, go to the pictures and see the examples uh, sure. for the like, like these pictures are about 100 years old. So this is a natural st stabilized uh, area because of the headland of Mount Lavinia. Okay. So Just the Mount Lavinia, second. sure, sure. The, yeah, the Mount Lavinia. So this is what you're referring to, right? Can you see? Yes, so this, yes, yes. I can see it clearly, and this is the natural big kind of formation by because of the headland where the Mount Lavinia Hotel is situated. So mm -hmm. that's how the Mount Lavinia uh, Hotel has got a private beach due to this headland uh, uh, like uh, geographic location. So now, uh, what uh, this so in this picture also you can clearly see the bay and the rock formation. This is naturally stable, mm. and now what the beach nourishment has done is 
now we uh, the beach nourishment has been carried on to the naturally stabilized area mm. so so the, this is the area that the whole beach, beach nourishment has occurred now now the problem is now now what we saw for the couple of months is like the south west monsoon started yeah now this in this picture we can clearly see the uh, bay and uh, the beach towards the other side so the from uh, now what has happened is the, the south west monsoon has started and this is the off season in this area so the wind factor plays a big role on the height of the wave height so now the wave height is about 0.9 meters closer to 1 meter so it has a big pounding effect when it comes and get crash crash to the uh, uh the nourished area so then it what happens is that it takes a big chunk out of the nourished sand because uh, uh, and uh, and because we have, there is no barrier uh, for the sand to it goes back freely so right. then again what will happen uh, in northeastern monsoon that that is when um, du during october to february the beach will regain because the winds will go down and the height of the uh, waves will regenerate uh, the beach back to his original state but the uh, the issue is now what we have done is we have uh, done a beach nourishment in a naturally stabilized area and the wave pattern doesn't support it because it has its own the nature has its own wave patterns um so but whatever the sand we have uh, accumulated to the ground and now now what has been washing off uh, we don't have a count like we don't have a count to say that how much much of it will be regenerated because of the unnatural uh, sand that we have been uh, putting into the show in that uh, naturally stabilized bay area um, yeah. and uh, this is a very classic example Uh, why we are saying that we need a, a environment impact assessment done because if when, when you are doing an environment impact assessment a coastal engineer who has a knowledge of oceanography would do a simple um, uh, modeling uh, called wave refraction modeling and you can model how the waves will act, react on on different uh, locations and different speeds and it can model the sand uh, sediment uh, movement so those are the important things of a uh, environment impact assessment right uh, yeah so that's and, a, that's uh, a very good point because uh, i think uh, eia not doing an eia on this thing is also a, a major factor so that's that's where i think i would like to bring in amila here um i want to ask amila what is the environment impact uh, specifically in the mount lavinia region and also the area where the sand was dredged from so amila yeah hello uh, so the environment of the area the coastal area around mount lavinia and the uh, shallow sea uh, area where the sand was dredged has certain unique uh, unique uh, factor like uh, in a coastal area like this especially as akita mentioned that the, as uh, this has a sandy beach towards south and rocky rocky uh, shore along uh, northern uh, beach area this has kind of a unique coastal ecosystem the uh, the rocks the rock outcrops on the northern side which is which, which we used to see uh, uh, until a few months back it was it was kind of a unique geographical formation that 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 it uh, also uh, related with the mount lavinia hotel so mm. this unique formation provide very di diverse habitat for coastal ecosystem coastal biodiversity in there 
now the rocky shores the rocky areas where 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 you can see due to the due to the wave action of the area the rocky shores provided various micro habitat like small crevices are there and there are tidal pools which are uh, which, which which we can see uh, on the uh, lower tide when the tide goes back uh, certain pools uh, uh, appear on the rock so this kind of minute habitat this kind of micro habitat provide the uh, pro provide the habitat uh, needs of uh, fauna and flora both especially certain coral dwelling species certain coral species as well as smaller fish which which are uh, associated with these rock outcrops and all all kind of other uh, more more uh, in coastal uh, invertebrate bed more like uh, sea urchins uh, these uh, these stars those kind of creatures are also found in these habitats these habitats this these coastal habitats are really dynamic area right the wave action on the rock and the in the and the uh, tidal movement on, on the coastal habitat provide very uh, very dynamic patterns uh, in the habitat so all these fauna that uh, that we mentioned all the coastal fauna are highly highly adapted to these conditions right they 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 they, they have they have been adapted to uh, utilize these conditions to the maximum uh, and uh, survive in these conditions so on the other hand the the shallow sea areas where the sand was spread uh, the complete complete uh, the bottom sea bottom was spread and uh, sand was collected from that that uh, that would definitely impact on the uh, local biodiversity in, on the uh, sandy uh, shallow sea bottom so there are other certain factors that they, that 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 governs the biodiversity in the coastal areas like uh, just uh, like i said the the substrate the rocky shore the rocks and the crevices and the microhabitat is provide health certain kind of biodiversity and the other kind of biodiversity where it is associated with the uh, sandy shores are determined by the uh, quality of the sand and the profile of the beach right we know that all beaches have a slope it is kind of a slope uh, moving from sea to uh, upward landward so this slope the the uh, slope uh, angle of the slope has support certain animals especially the bur burrowing animals that lives on the coast and the the sand the, uh, the grain size of sand also helps the this uh, particular fauna living in the area so the, the when we consider the whole whole project the beach nourishment project there were there were few major activities like uh, like uh, the dredging of sand and then the uh, beach nourishment nourishment that took place on the coast so why through these activities there has there were a direct impact on these coastal ecosystems and the coastal biodiversity you can't really say that there is no no environmental Im impacts in the projects like this definitely there is a, there, there there are a certain kind of environment environmental impact on local biodiversity as well as the uh, coastal ecosystem the pattern of the ecosystem mm -hmm. so this the uh, this is kind of unavoidable if we are really doing a beach nourish right you have to uh, pile up sand on the coast so you have the by doing that you 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 submerge all the you cover all the my coastal microhabitat from sand layers of sand so that would definitely cover the small crevices and the other other microhabitat that were utilized by coastal biodiversity before that so that impact is kind of unavoidable if you really if you are doing any any kind of the uh, any kind of uh, nourishment that nourishment activities in the coastal area but though certain certain damages are unavoidable there is always a room for minimizing these damages there is always mm -hmm. a room improvement the the uh, bringing out sustainable practices where you can you can minimize the damage and make sure that the the, the ecosystem is recovered very soon right if you consider the whole project is the it was done for like four five years that the 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 biodiversity should recover at some point sooner the better mm -hmm. right so certain practices should be done including the eia which eia process and the practices uh, which can we, uh, we which we can incorporate into these kind of uh, development project should be done to make sure that the 
environmental damage is minimized and recovered so uh, as soon as possible that is the whole point of conducting an eia in my opinion it's not to it's not to uh, uh, prevent development it's to make mm-hmm. sure that develop happens in a way that the environmental impact is minimized and sustainability is ensured so we'll talk about that in uh, later and that's the o- overall overview of the coastal biodiversity and uh, how it can be impacted by uh, uh, which are different or any other activity which is done on the coastal ecosystem a quick follow up question on that i think akita may might know a little bit more about this uh, has there been any damage to the reefs because of the dredging ships um we we cannot be certain at this very moment because uh, we have not dived there or uh, and we have not seen anything happened uh, because of the, the covid uh, e, um, situation but uh, but there are high chances of uh, this uh, sand can be uh, like this high sediment can uh, uh, impact the reef system of the uh, um, mount levenia beach because as we know there are three uh, reef formations the first reef is about uh, 1.5 meters to 8 meter depth and uh, the second reef is the palagala and that is about 12 meters to 18 meters depth and there's a third reef to the deeper waters of 4, uh, 23 meters and below so these reef systems uh, can be affected by uh, sedimentation but we have no proof of that but uh, there's a high uh, chance if uh, if the uh, sand ca- was carried towards northly or uh, to the sea it, it can happen but there is no proof uh, mm. but if there is uh, sedimentation happening on these reefs uh the ha- fish habitat can be affected because these uh shoreline uh, reefs act as essential fish habitat for juvenile fish and uh, fish spawning um those are the gen- uh, main fish generation for the bigger uh schools of fish which mm-hmm. um, uh, like th- there will be economic impact because there are yeah. uh, about 150 fishing families uh, who are livelihood is like on these reefs so yeah. uh, there are we we are we at this moment we are not we can't uh, be like we can't confirm yeah. anything because we have not seen right. anything yeah right uh, praveen uh, so you are a civil engineer so uh, can i ask you what are the technical requirements in conducting a proper beach nourishment uh yeah so first thing when you think of a beach nourishment or any intervention is that you have to make sure that's a requirement and that the beach erosion is not seasonal um and that there is a permanent removal of sediment and rock from the uh, area of interest if there is and if there is a requirement then you, there are four main methods of looking into be, this intervention um, one is you can advance the line where you move the defenses seawards sort of like a land reclamation or a beach nourishment the good thing with something like this is you actually get the shoreline and a beach and then the development behind the sh- uh, beach is also protected but on the flip side you do get a lot of environmental impact on the dredge site and the shoreline and still the erosion the deficit of uh, sediment in that area has not been addressed so the erosion will continue um and um, the life span of this project is sort of short lived and it's a very expensive affair um second you can go into hold the line measure where you build either a breakwater or a seawall this will protect this will be a more sturdy a more long lasting solution but then it it will also protect your, the development behind the shore but you will lose the beach um and this is also a hard engineering solution so you will cause a significant amount of disruption to the area you thirdly you can opt to do nothing uh, this is ideal if there is no development behind the shore there is no uh, significant economic loss and let nature take its course 
Or fourthly, you can uh, opt a managed retreat where um, you move the development further inland and let the erosion come in towards the shore, but make measures to slow down and prevent the erosion from further occurring. Best example for this I can give is the Abbots Hall Farm in UK, which was part of the Blackport Estuary. Um, so that area is a conserved area, significant uh, scientific and environmental interest in, in that area. There's an old seawall, which is inadequate. And to increase the size of the seawall would mean a further, ex uh, further unaffordable expense with the increase in sea level rise. Uh, so what they simply did was they breached the seawall in certain places and let the sea come in. Uh, part, obviously, the farm did lose part of the farmland, which turned into a salt marsh. Uh, the farm was all compensated for it, and the farm also gained uh, a place to grow salt grass-fed sheep. So they sort of had a value addition from that side as well. Uh, in addition, they can obviously uh, do a creation of an artificial reef uh, out seawards that will reduce the impact of erosion. Um, but to consider any of these four as, uh, options, you have to gather a lot of data. For example, you need um, to find out the environmental processes, the ecological aspect of the uh, area, the hydrodynamic processes, uh, basically the waves, the wind. You need to think about the long shore waves, the cross shore waves. Um, then the seasonal meteorological trends, like the monsoon season, the seasons that we find in Sri Lanka and the sediment process. So what you talk about the sand budget, how much sand sediment comes in and how much sediment goes out. Uh, the transport parts, the, um, and then you need to consider the geology. If you have like cliff face, then you need to think about the soil strata. If you have, for example, like Mount Lavinia, you have a lot of rocks. Those are so, uh, also need to be um, considered. And then the long-term environmental trends, like the rising sea level, sea level and climate change. You, it'll be an, it'll, it's expensive to keep adding more and more, um, for example, um, sea walls uh, to combat something like climate change. And then finally, you need to think about the political and economic conditions. The land use, uh, the development trends behind the show, um, and the public safety. So if you do something like a beach nourishment, obviously, <clears throat> you expect people to use the beach. You expect people to go into the water. Um, and with something like a beach management, there are varying new currents and undertones. So you have to consider the beach goers. And finally, the economic aspect. So especially for a country like Sri Lanka that's dealing on, uh, that's lending money year on year. When you put money into it, you have to make sure that um, there is a return on it. For example, Florida, um, California beaches, they make sure the return on investment is two and a half times of what they invest in the beach nourishment. So these conditions must be met in order to design a proper um, uh, intervention method. Mudir? Yes, that's, yeah, that's a really good uh, explanation. I also want to go a little into the erosion side, but before that, I, I mean, uh, the biggest topic here is the the EIA, I think, you know, uh, doing something of this large scale without an EIA is a problem. So I want to bring in Malisha here. Uh, I want to ask her what what's an EIA and reasons why they should have done an EIA or maybe an IEE before doing such project. Yes, Manita. So, um, an EIA stands for Environmental Impact Assessment, and IEE is what we call an Initial Environmental Examination. So, an EIA is basically a process uh, where we assess the negative environmental impacts that uh, a project could have and uh, provide uh, mitigation efforts to minimize the damage done. And it's, uh, it's an instrument that public officials can use to determine what exactly are the impacts. So it's basically like a, a, a map to better guide themselves when they are conducting a project that might have uh, adverse impacts on the environment. Um, and IEE is done if there are no significant environmental uh, damages that, uh, that a project could have on the environment. Um, so 
another very important feature of an EIA is that not only does it uh, take into consideration the effects of the environment, it also considers the public opinion because once an EIA is done, uh, it's required to be open uh, for public comments for a period of 30 days. So anyone of us can uh, go and uh, re review this EIA and suggest any areas where it needs improvement. And the project proponent then has to get back to us uh, on those comments. So going in blind without an EIA is really detrimental because there can be uh, there can be damage that cannot be reversed uh, on our environment. So uh, there are quite a few reasons why it's very important to do an EIA or at least an IE, especially with regards to uh, the Mount Lavinia project. Uh, firstly, because this uh, project changes the landscape of Mount Lavinia Beach entirely. The beach as we know it. Uh, that has, even by pictures, uh, like we showed before, uh, it hasn't really changed. Uh, so, uh, and also it's done uh, using, facilitated, it's by our funds, by public funds. And so factoring in the public opinion is very important here. And they have failed to do an EIA, and that has left us with many unanswered questions because we are here trying to figure out why was a beach nourishment done? What are the justifications of the project? What are the possible alternatives to a beach nourishment? Was there a high risk of erosion at the time of uh, you know uh, coming proposing this project? And also, what was the opinion of the key stakeholders involved, like the residents in the area, the fishermen? Um, and also the restaurants nearby, because uh, the director general did mention that uh, this project is not only done to prevent coastal erosion, but also to boost tourism as well as the fishing industry. Um, so for uh, him to uh, dismiss any environmental concerns without, without this document is problematic, uh, because that is the only proof where you can uh, say that uh, we have considered the environmental impacts and we have provided mitigation efforts and uh, followed through. Um, and the DG in several locations have mentioned that an EIA is not necessary for uh, projects done in areas with high risk of uh, coastal erosion. Uh, now, there are two issues with this statement. Firstly, because um, if we go back to the point of approval, uh, the CCD is both the project uh, proponent as well as the project approving agency of this project. So along with that, uh, there is uh, somewhat of uh, a discretionary power provided by the section 16 of the Coast Conservation and Coastal Resource Management Act to the DG uh, in deciding whether to do an EIA or an IE. And, uh, but you know, what we need to note is that uh, this discretion is limited uh, if you have to cite the case Karagan Lewaya, uh, it has upheld that uh, if this decision should be made after a proper assessment of the facts. And another important thing is we need to look at this more holistically instead of just looking at the uh, one act. And uh, if I'm to cite uh, some cases like uh, Environmental Foundation Limited versus Mahaveli Authority of Sri Lanka, uh, uh, the justice uh, in that case upheld that the agencies have to be guided by the principles and uh, the fundamental duties that our constitution has provided. So, and going back to our constitution, it does uh, impose directive principles where the state is to protect, preserve, and improve the environment. And it imposes a duty on um, every person of Sri Lanka to protect and conserve its riches. So the CCD is no exception uh, to this duty and they cannot evade the duty. And also referring to the statement made by Justice Amar Singha in the Bulankulam case, which is a very important case, um, EIS are in intended to foster sound decision making and not to generate more paperwork. So we do have enough case law and even our constitution, which is the grand norm of our country, um, requires us to prioritize environmental conservation when we're going ahead with development projects. But if authorities like uh, the Director General, they uh, who are vested with the very duty of uh, conserving our environment are to find loopholes in the law to go ahead with uh, projects by uh, avoiding EIS. It's very alarming and we need to make sure that this won't happen in the future. Um, over to you, Mugita. Thank you. Uh, this definitely very important, the legal framework and how authorities are actually, like, you know, uh, using these loopholes for their own benefit. Um, 
So this is something we are standing against, uh, especially the Pearl Protectors is an organization that is dedicated towards protecting the marine environment. And uh, we can see when there's, when there's a project done without any sustainability, uh, the project won't last. Uh, so now we are seeing it, you know, within 30 days, the beach uh, nourished area is pretty much gone. So um, I'm, I want to move back to Avishka. Uh, so Mount Lavinia wasn't the only place, only beach nourishment that was done under this project. So we also know that Kalido Beach in Kalutur and also Angulana uh, was beach nourished. How has this beach nourishment affected the Kalido in Kalutara and Angulana? Okay, um, I just I just give a brief intro into um, why they decided to do a beach nourishment in Kalido as well, since that is the main uh, portion of this project. Um, so there was a severe flooding in twenty seventeen uh, in Kalutara and. Um, the sand the, the sandbars close to the Kalido estuary uh, face severe erosion, uh, resulting in a subsequent erosion of the vast area of beach in Kalutura North as, as a result of the encroaching waves. And uh, the residents in the area, um, the fishermen and uh, the rest of the residents basically demanded for a solution. <clears throat> Since the sandbars were actually the reason that uh, the town didn't get that damage during uh, the 2004 tsunami. And um, so the first phase of the project was to create an artificial beach two kilometers in length and 25 uh, meters wide in Calido Beach as a remedy to this issue. Um, approximately 300,000 cubic meters of sand was used to fill this beach, which was dredged from the deep sea. Uh, and the second phase of the project was the one kilometer stretch of Angulana Beach, Ratmalana, and finally, the third phase was the 500 meter stretch at Mount Lavinia. Um, so as, as mentioned before as well, Mount Lavinia experiences seasonal erosion. Um, but both Calido Beach and Angulana had severe erosion, which is why the project was um, initiated in these two uh, areas. But what's important to highlight here is that <laughs> beach nourishment in Calido Beach as well as Angulana was not successful as well. So it's not just Mount Lavinia. These two beaches were not successful either. And uh, there's evidence now that it's not. Uh, there have been a few news reports of it and there's been images uh, shared around by residents as well. Uh, that within 30 days, within just 30 days um, of completing the beach management project at Calido, uh, the sand has started to cover the road. I'll, I'll show an image later. Uh, has started to cover the road um, um, alongside the beach. And currently, uh, there are backhoes trying to remove the sand from the road um, in the past few days uh, and put it back to the beach. And at the same time, they're trying to um, uh, place rock boulders to fix the failed artificial beach in, in, in Calido. So all in all, it looks like uh, this has not only been a waste of money, but also a huge waste of resources. I'll just show you a few um, few pictures if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, can you see this? Uh, let me see. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this is the sand that has come onto the road, onto a main road. Oh. And this is also just pictures of the water coming in onto the beach from the rock boulders. And I will just show you a small clip Can you see this? 
So as you can see, um, both of these, uh, so even Calida Beach has uh, been unsuccessful. And we have reports that Angolana Beach um, has also been unsuccessful. Mm. OK, thank you. Um, so before I go back to Akita, I actually want to make uh, highlight a statement the DG recently made. This was stating that they filled, uh, they did this beach nourishment uh, up to the point where the sand erosion happened. Uh, and so he, what he's stating is basically Mount Lemineo is sand eroded. Like I, I think uh, or most of you have uh, highlighted that issue. Uh, what something he said was he filled it up to the point where by 2014-2015 where the sand was um, once was and during the last four years the sand had eroded. So he specifically mentioned uh, that it was 2014 the sand was there as up to the point where the sand was uh, you know nourished. So just want to share the screen here uh, because I want to highlight this part as well. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up, Google Earth. So this is an image from, you can see, right? Everybody can see. So let's go back to 2009, right? You can see it's a little blurry, but this is 2009. Uh, this is how the beach looks like, looked like in 2000, you can see. Uh, this is the point where the beach nourishment happened up to I can't 150. See the image. We can't see the image. No, no, no. We can't see anything. It's just okay, a hold on. Oh, I see. So I don't think Google is allowing you to share the image. Oh, let me see. So anyway, uh, I think there's a, it's white, isn't it? Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Well, if you go on Google Earth and you can like, you know, this is the statement we, which we are, we've been telling like, you know, how false he, uh, the statement he has made. If you go on Google Earth, anybody who is on Google Earth, you can go on uh, view and you can click on historical images and you can go all the way back. So you can see the beach has been how it is. And like how Akita said, um, you know, for the last hundreds of years, the, this beach has been the same as how it used to be. So, um, so going back to Akita, my question for you is, I think we need to also speak about the economical aspects of this as well. Uh, but what are the other alternatives uh, which are available as solutions for beach or sand nourishment? Um, and what are um, economical impacts? Uh, Mudita, on that point, um, as, as um, Praveen said, uh, there are hard and uh, soft engineering methods, but it all depends on the economic aspect of the project, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, or the social aspect of the project. Um, so, like, Recently, what uh, Navy did uh, uh, the the museum project actually it acts as a, a breakwater uh, for the area as well. So those kind of projects are really good for uh, Mount Lemini as well. If we want to make the wave uh, coming to the wa the wave speed, like we, if we want to reduce the wave speed and um, and natural uh, barrier would be uh, Khadulana. So, like, they are. So, this whole uh, beach uh, nourishment uh, is a world uh, issue now because this is linked to climate change. So, when the climate change happens and the water levels are rising around the world, 
the beach is we are losing land area so uh, if we take uh, florida uh, australia gold coast um um hawaii all these uh, places they are uh, putting in money uh, for uh, beach replenishment um so it is a world uh, wide issue at the moment uh, yeah so we will have to come up with then again uh, sri lanka has not uh, as affected much uh, when we look at the world uh, scenario but now we are getting affected as we can see calido and um, angolana so those are now we are getting affected our economy is getting affected by uh, sea life sea level rising yeah what are the other solutions that are available like um, um instead- so we we can do uh, like so mount um, golf face green is a good example so what they have done is long time ago they have created a, a wall where the sea was not coming in right still the, that wall is there so the, the, as what pravin said the, there are hard um, engineering methods like creating boulders creating uh, retention uh, uh, parap- walls and um, and uh, and there are soft options like putting uh, uh, reefs in um, artificial reefs um, uh, like restoration of na- like beach nourishment um, stabilizing sand dunes um, mm. yeah there are those are the options that we have right uh amila uh, so what are the best practices in protecting the marine habitat uh, especially around this area uh now mudda the best thing that we could have done that could have implemented in this scenario is uh, conducting a proper eia to begin with because an eia as malisha also mentioned eia eia has different parts the different dif- different different components it doesn't only mean that uh, the environmental impacts are being uh, studied uh, listed or anything it's it just not it's not really just a document right it's a way of uh, ensuring sustainability and a, uh, and a mechanism to uh, the mechanism to make sure that the project is done economic economically project is economically viable social socially uh, responsible and environmental uh, the sustainable so uh, in an eia if if a, if a proper eia or even an ie was done uh, we we could have we could have have a basic baseline information on the uh, project site right now in the previous in the previous uh, discussion sakita and also malisha also mentioned i think the the exact state of the biodiversity or the ecosystem right now is still unknown to us right mm-hmm. the uh, and the baseline information to say that this was the condition uh, where, uh, where 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 the condition that was before the beach nourishment is not there because an eia was not done if an eia was done before the project on the project site i am not talking about the i am not talking about the eia that has been done on the uh, sand dredging activity that is something else right that that just a part of the activity part of the uh, development project that was done so the exact site where the coastal the shore, uh, shoreline area where the nourishment has been done we should have we should have uh, done an eia proper eia and provide the baseline information on what was the status of environment and biodiversity and socio economic on the project site before the uh, before the implementation was done right now in an eia in a proper eia eia it was, if, if it's done properly it would have it would have surveyed all the area the the project site and the vicinity of the area as well and document whatever the environmental mm. important uh, important site sensitive site sensitive biota sensitive biodiversity fauna flora anything or sensitive sensitive uh, 
sensitive places where that is important to the people local people local community as well so that would have if if that was done we could have provided the the people who are doing the environmental impact assessment could have provided uh, provided uh, suggestions to to uh, you know uh, refrain from uh, developing certain areas certain sites uh, in mount lavinia ecosystems in mount lavinia coastal ecosystems that we 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 we, we have uh, we, we have used to see before this before all this uh, development was uh, happening the rock outcrop the rock and rocky shore area is kind of a unique system in the area right that's the that, that in uh, personally i have visited that place as a as a student to bio, study coastal biodiversity right that is the closest place to uh, colombo where you can see the rocky shore uh, habitats and rock outcrop and we have even yeah, i have even uh, participated in workshops where uh, field studies was conducted mm. in this mount lavinia beach right so that is an important representative habitat uh, closest to uh, colombo and provide an important and an interesting perspective towards our coastal biodiversity that should have preserved uh, should have kept uh, in, in some way measures should have been taken to uh, make sure that habitat is intact after this uh, whatever nourishment uh, economical nourishment that has been uh, taken place so that process that that identifying those sensitive areas identifying those sensitive systems would have been a part of a part of a part of a proper eia right and also uh, the all the engineering perspectives of all the oceanographic graphic perspectives of this project the uh, the action of uh, waves and current and the uh, sand budget uh, activities and all these things should have been taken into account before exact project was planned and i don't see how it can be done just based on an, an eia that was done on the dead time right so in a way we have the uh, the, the uh, developers has completely ignored the whatever processes that was going on in the project site and whatever importance that it holds uh, so first part of sus- ensuring sustainability within sri lankan framework sri lankan legal framework would have been doing a proper eia and getting the recommendations from the expert uh, on uh, expert on environment and uh, social economic systems and oceanography and geography uh, uh, geological mm-hmm. processes so and while doing the while doing the uh, development there are certain practices that uh, we should uh, we should uh, follow to make sure that the recovery of the ecosystems the recovery of the biodiversity in the area uh, is ensured uh, for an example there has been uh, in, in there has been other studies around the world where they have monitored the actually monitored the biodiversity changes in the beach nourishment areas where they have uh, they have said that the the material that we are that we are using to uh, for the beach nourishment should be compatible with the local environment in the area like uh, right for example the, the sand that is being used should be compatible with the sand present in the uh, coastal ecosystem mm-hmm. that we are nourishing so that would have supported the recovery of the biodiversity if the grain sizes of the sand if the if the uh, texture of the sand if the material the material qualities of sand is similar to what it was in the area the biodiversity would have uh, that would have recovered uh, much uh, sooner than uh, it would have uh, under different situation under different scenario so in previous studies it has been shown that that the coastal biodiversity has recovered within months if the implementation if the development activity of activities was done properly properly planned understanding the wave dynamics and uh, ocean dynamics in the area and also using proper material which is compatible to the local environment in other cases where it, has, it, it was not implemented properly it has taken years even after years the coastal biodiversity has not recovered to the state it was right so there there, there are dynamics in this process there, there there are both there are many different perspectives to consider just biodiversity and environment might not be the uh, 
primary focus in projects like this but mm. whatever we do the economic activities the economic uh, development that we are pursuing should go hand in hand with by hand in hand with environment and the biodiversity as well so doing these things doing following these sustainability practices and making sure that the project is sustainable is a plus point is a plus point for the marketing perspective as well right to attract more tourists to the area as well so that that yeah, that would have been an uh, value added uh, process value addition to the whole 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 beach arrangement if it was done uh, in a proper manner right now we are experiencing that there has been there has been certain uh, uh, there has been has been issues with the technical component as well so it is not it has not been practical uh, from the engineering perspective it properly uh, on the engineering perspective as well so it's not it's it, it's not a success story anymore so it has been detrimental to the detrimental to the environment as well as to the economy so under a proper eia if it was done independently by proper expert that would have been a completely different scenario so from this the sri lankan perspective yeah. from sri lankan framework of uh, activity i would say conducting a proper eia and following the guidelines following the uh, recommendations given and also monitoring we should monitor whatever development activities we are doing right that is part of the eia process as well there should be a monitoring process if that was done the statements mm-hmm. like uh, we heard before we don't know the exact situation of the reef right now that would have that would not have been there right we would, we would have monitor there there should there should be monitoring process as well so we have the process we have the process on board we have we have uh, we have uh, all the regulations and the framework is there the implementation is the part that is lacking so i would right. think i would uh, like to recommend in any development activities not just this one make sure that a proper eia is, is done and you are adhering to the recommendation that is given that would be that would ensure the sustainability and long term uh, preservation of the biodiversity of sri lanka as well exactly and we see like in in other countries like europe eia they give so much prominence to doing an eia so it has to happen in sri lanka especially being an island especially uh, being a tropical island with all these biodiversity we have to consider in the environment uh, along with doing the development so um, i think next question i i have is for um, praveen um, so the dg came out recently and he made a statement what he said was now when with all these sand being uh, you know uh, eroded whatever the sand that was down the beach uh, the sand nourished area when it was eroding he came out and said oh this is a sand um, sand engine method right so all the sand that was supposed to erode is supposed to go like 2 3 kilometers north and uh, you know that is supposed to cover the eroded areas up until the hivala maybe up to even vellavatta so um what my question to you is is this in fact a sand engine method um yeah so um so to make the first of all the sand engine method uh, is a, a still an experiment done in the netherlands uh, and as an alternative to beach nourishment because of the relatively short life span of a standard beach nourishment the thing was for them they needed 12 cubic megameters of sand um, to do a normal beach nourishment but with the increasing sea level rise and climate change in order to maintain the coastline they needed to do at least 80 cubic megameters uh, per year that would mean a standard beach nourishment would uh, be a be a larger beach which would limit the access to the water which would uh, reduce the attractiveness of the beach um, which would mean a significant cost increase and a significant impact on both the dredging and the uh, filling side of a uh, normal beach nourishment so the, what they did was they decided to do a mega project Uh, a once in 20 year project where they create the sand engine and that will supply the sediment needed to maintain the shoreline um 
So, um, and one key thing for a sand engine is you need a longshore movement of sediment to the other places that you need nourishing. Um, for example, um, and you don't see that in Mount Lavinia Beach because of the fact that Akita mentioned that there is a headland where the Mount Lavinia Hotel sits on. So there's no longshore movement where the sand was placed. Um, there's only a crossroad movement. And whatever sand that moves out, um, they will first have to face the reefs that are there uh, slightly northwards um, of the Mount Lavinia Beach area. Um, and then you need to consider the socioeconomic um, uh, sector of this uh, beach nourishment. You need to consider the engineering. You need to con consider the environmental side of it. Um, so if you think about the DERF, uh, DERF course in Netherlands, what they did, they did a study for three years and not just environmental or engineering. They also consulted the Coast Guard because they know with the movement of sand, there is a change in um, the undertow, the riptides and the currents. And something like a beach management, they want people to use the beach. So with such um, changing currents, people's lives are also at risk. So they even after uh, the project, they, for 10 years, they kept monitoring that uh, project to ensure the success of it and to ensure the safety of the beach goers. Um, and also the sand engine um, is, has to be a long-term solution. If you have to do uh, nourishment every five years, you're disrupting the environment regularly. You can't let it grow. But the sand engine was designed as a mega project. So they use, in the Netherlands, they use 17 and a half million cubic meters of sand. Um, and their plan was for it to last 20 years. But with all the monitoring, they can safely say that it's going to last for longer than 20 years. Um, the current uh, monitoring shows that after four years of the sand engine, 95% of the sand they put is still in that monitored zone. 80% of that sand in the sand engine is still where they put it. So um, with our context, the issue is that there is a lack of planning, a lack of research, lack of baseline of what we want and what will happen. Um, so with all of that, this is anything but a sand engine or an engineered approach. This is just a dumping of sand and public funds into a show. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So that's that's uh, that's very important because uh, the the director general of Coastal Conservation Department during any briefings never has he mentioned of a sand engine method prior, but only when the sand was being eroded suddenly after like 30, 40 days did he come out and say, oh, this is supposed to be for sand engine. So, uh, I mean, this is this is a deception of the public. So I, I, I don't think as a public official, he should be stating these things. Uh, in fact, he should uh, come out and say like, you know, uh, there has been a mistake or if there's been any flaws just to rectify them so that moving forward, um, things can be fixed. Um, so finally, I want to ask uh, Malisha the question, the most important question. Um, so, what is the current status of the legal proceedings and what can we expect in the future? Yeah, um, so uh, with regards to recommendations made, uh, I'd like to mention um, two recommendations made by uh, two environmental and legal experts who have uh, been voicing out their concerns from the beginning of this project and as well as supporting us to better understand uh, the legal framework. Uh, so the, the reason why this, uh, why the DG has uh, uh, sort of gotten away rather with uh, not doing an EIA by an EIA is the broad discretion that's been uh, given by Section 16 of the said Act. So uh, according to Mr. Jagat Bunamardana, who's a senior environmentalist as well as an attorney at law, um, he recommends that the Section 16 of the Coast Conservation and Coastal Resource Management Act needs to be amended so that um, the project approving uh, 
agencies, are, it's not just the CCD, but also other bodies like MEPA and CEA. So this actually solves two problems. Like in the future, if CCD is to once again uh, take up their own project and approve it, uh, that uh, uh, natural justice principle uh, where they will be judging their own case won't be uh, an issue because there's MEPA or CEA. Uh, and so that discretion provided is going to be narrowed down. And um, on the other side, uh, Humani Rana Singha, who's uh, a lecturer of law at the University of Peradeniya, recommends that um, in moving forward, we need to make sure that our public representatives, public officials, and uh, civil societies need to be more involved in making sure that the environmental rule of law is upheld. Um, and so it's basically, at the end of the day, uh, no matter how many laws we have, if our public officials don't abide by them, if they don't comply with them, and we don't question their actions, there's always leeway for them to uh, make decisions uh, that put our environment at risk. So while it's very important that we need to make amendments and our, uh, make our laws stronger, uh, we also need to make sure that we hold this, uh, we push these entities to be more transparent, more accountable in uh, their decision-making procedure and uh, considering the public opinion. Uh, because these are, at the end of the day, our funds that have been uh, used and wasted um, in uh, going ahead with projects, just blindly going in uh, without doing an EIA to first assess uh, what areas need to be uh, considered and uh, what damages need to be mitigated. And so um, we need to make sure we raise awareness about uh, uh, environmental laws because it's very important that everyone understands this and uh, everyone respects and enforces these laws. So uh, the benefits of environmental protection can be enjoyed by both the planet and us. And also with regards to uh, the court proceedings, Mudita, uh, Center for Environmental Justice is currently seeking for a grant of writ of mandamus uh, to, uh, in, in eight areas. And so we are hoping the outcome would be that EIS are made more mandatory for projects like this and that uh, our officials don't go ahead with projects by uh, not prioritizing environmental conservation and uh, sustainable development. So, over to you. What is your on mute? What is that? Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, it is indeed uh, positive news uh, that uh, CEJ, Mr. Hemant Vitanagi, has taken uh, uh, the lead on, like, you know, uh, making litigations on this process. So uh, we can all support um, on this matter. But there's, I think I'm looking at the questions, and there is at least more than two or three questions where they're asking about what is happening with the pollution in Mount Lavinia. This is unprecedented. You know, um, so I would like to open this question. I mean, we are running out of time also. So um, quickly from starting from Malisha, um, uh, what is what do you think is happening uh, in Mount Lavinia, according to your opinion? Yeah, so when we got to know about this uh, plastic gushing into the beach and uh, the picture circulated. Uh, we were very concerned and uh, our team uh, gathered more volunteers and we went to uh, Mount Lavinia Beach to conduct, I think, about three beach cleanups. And uh, no matter how much you clean, there's always more garbage piling up in the beach area. And I think what we found more shocking than the plastic on the beach itself is the amount of plastic that was in the waves. And when we, would, when we go in the water, there's plastic bags just getting wrapped in our feet. So this was this was shocking to us. And so when we looked at the plastics that are on the beaches, what we found mostly is uh, plastic sachets um, and uh, plastic food packaging and plastic bags. And this waste seemed quite recent also. So um, there are several theories on how this garbage might have ended up here. And uh, so it's once again, it, it is the duty of our public uh, authorities to investigate this matter and take necessary uh, action against whoever caused this or um, to solve any other like ways uh, that uh, 
that might have if it's if it's a natural cause then that's also up to them to solve and this is also one of the areas that uh, CEJ has uh, filed for action about uh, for asking all the respondents to uh, carry out investigations in finding out uh, who may have done this and to hold those perpetrators uh, accountable for this. So, right. To you. Avishka, you also came and volunteered in cleaning the beach. What, what is your observation? Um, you're on mute. Avishka, okay. you're on Avishka. mute. Yeah. You can hear me now, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, no. Um, so when I first came with you guys, um, I was actually shocked because I have seen that beach before and it was never that uh, polluted. But I've heard that there has been pollution in the waves for quite some time there, but it hasn't been washed up and so as much as it has in the last few days. So one of the theories that I I think could have happened is since they dredged the sand not so far away from the coast. Um, and because it is the monsoon season and we get all these waves uh, roughing up and coming on to shore, maybe because of the disturbed seabed, all the plastic that's been kind of settled on the, on the seabed would have just gone up into the waves again and come on to shore. Um, mm. And that's just one theory that I have. I mean, there's no proof to it. Oh, I'm not definitely saying that that is the case, but I'm just saying um, that could be also a possibility. I mean, in terms of the new dates of the packaging that we found, I mean, that could also be um, like, uh, like I mean, there, there, there could be new new packaging as well, because we do know that a lot of the canal communities do throw in garbage. Uh, and and it could have easily just end, ended up in that area. And because um, we know that once the garbage goes into the sea, there's no specific place it, it goes and collects. It just mm. it moves on with the waves and the currents inside the water as well. So, mm. I mean, there there could be not just one reason. There could be many reasons for this, but that's just one uh, thought. Akita, what do you think? Um, I would. Um, I, I I had I had a um, I had a very uh, interesting uh, theory by Dr. Patiarachi, who's. Uh, working in Western Australia, University of Western Australia, he said uh, the gradient of the show, uh, the beach now is uh, different. Uh, like it has a very, uh, uh, the gradient is high. So the waves uh, will come and hit the show and the, the power of the wave would decrease. Uh, and the garbage would uh, come onto the shore when the high, high tide is there. So that is a very good reasoning because what I have noticed is uh, uh, there is there is always have been a lot of uh, garbage in the sea. Like uh, with our videos that we want to show, uh, as we can, everybody can see that there is pollution. Like no, like all this time. Uh, now, now only we see this pollution on the seashore, but it was already there. So um, it was nothing new or anything. But this thing has like this canals are taking all the garbage into the sea and dumping it in our reefs. And um, especially if our second reef, the Palagala reef, is is it's a rocky reef. The coral is growing on it. The turtles are there. The barracuda fish is there, puffer fish is there, most of the fish are there, but they, they are with the garbage. So now with the current, the, with the uh, south uh, west monsoon, the garbage is coming into the shore. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing, uh, another thing would be the dredging, because uh, the, as everybody knows, like in this panel, like we saw some pictures with the locations of the dredging ship uh, during the dredging time. It was they were really close to the shore, and some pictures are there on Palagala. So these contributing fact, they, these factors can contribute uh, to this uh, plastic issue that we are facing. Mm. Praveen, do you have an opinion on that? Um, yes, brother. So obviously, did the sand nourishment 
it changed the shoreline it changed the ocean it changed how the waves react the energy of the wave the current um so all of these uh, are leading factors of what we see at the beach right now um, obviously these would have been identified if a study was done if it was engineered before that with an eia um and obviously this dg said this was done to attract tourists locals let alone tourists won't go to a very polluted beach like that so the lack of studying lack of prevention of these things and the use of public funds without uh, a success of uh, failure of such a project must be accounted for so these factors would have been identified if a proper study was done before mm, definitely and amila what is your opinion on what is happening there uh i think the situation was kind of whatever hypothesis that we have has been right by all our participants so i would like to say on another point whatever was the impact behind the uh, huge public uh, declaration on this is the page that we have to is the copy that we have produced and released no matter what uh, amila uh, hold on Just give me a second you uh, can you repeat that part because i think your voice is muffled can you hear me now your voice is muffled can you uh, can you repeat that yeah now uh, yeah okay it wasn't clear before okay can you repeat that last part you... yes so what what i mean we mean whatever the hypothesis behind this whatever the uh, factors that are causing this accumulation of garbage this garbage has been produced and released to the sea by us right so uh, no matter what was the uh, governing factor behind this what was the engineering of it, uh, moving uh, acting on it the mm. in a way we and the, uh, the authorities that are that are supposed to deal with these issues have failed so that is what is causing uh, this uh, huge garbage uh, accumulation uh, mm. the physical process and all these that these are just 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 that is nothing so we have been the deal. definitely so yeah like amila said we i mean the the root cause of this pollution is of course us you know if we all can reduce and refuse uh, single use plastic sachets yeah, we could have done a lot more change now what is happening is our, our beaches not just mount lavinia throughout all the beaches are being polluted uh, the seabeds are drastically uh, polluted 80% of our western province seabed is polluted we, we are having 50% of our sea around around sri lanka is polluted so these are these are unprecedented numbers we as an island who who loves who should love our environment should uh, you know take action be more responsible be aware of what is happening and uh, not just the citizens or not just the people the authorities the uh, everyone who's governing the country should give priority for this so the reason why we did this webinar is for for the public to be aware of the facts behind uh doing this uh, beach nourishment the recent beach nourishment and in fact it is a failed beach nourishment we can see from angulana how much destruction the residents are hating that uh, project over there even around uh, mount lavinia we uh, like abishka said this uh, this was done during a uh, uh, during a time when we were going through a pandemic uh, fortunately we were able to highlight this issue now we are seeing within 40 days of uh, within a few months uh that sand that was nourished has all washed out we so today we spoke to everyone and i think we got a wholesome uh, you know uh, um, uh, set of statistics and uh, an idea what is happening and so our request to everybody who's listening would be to be more be more aware we can't do anything right now there's no point that we can't go put the sand back in the ocean uh -huh. what we can do is we need to uh stop these activities from happening in the future uh, uh this has to be a precedent uh and uh the authorities need to be more uh concerned for our environment and give priority so 
finally thank you guys for all i think we we gone way beyond our time limit as well uh amila you have to go to mana i think so uh so we'll wrap this thing up so thank you all you guys are all very thank you good all of us are pearl protectors so uh that's the beauty of this we all had our expertise put into this project and we all did our research so that was the great part of it thank you amila thank you praveen thank you avishka thank you amalisha and thank you akita uh thanks thanks for everything and thank you for everyone who was listening uh for this uh, live broadcast have a good day take care bye thank you thank you everyone